um, I want to thank Expression and your team, Jennifer, and you, and the rest of you for having us here. We love it here, and we're so proud of you. Uh, I know LA is a unique community, and it's really the hub of where really the nation goes is in this city and what comes out of the city. And I know that you guys, a lot of you, even to come here and be a part of a community that wants to make Jesus famous is important so important and I know that it costs you to, to really really fight to be a part of, of, of a community in a place like this I went to high school in Pasadena and uh, junior high in Arcadia so I know a little bit about LA except I never paid my bills here so it's not really that fair <laughs> so um, let's pray and open and you can open up your Bibles to John 10 10 and we will get started so Lord help amen so John 10.10 10 is really a clear, a clear passage that Jesus gives us as believers. This is a foundational verse, and it says this. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you may have a life and have it abundantly. The thief comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. But I've come that you may have life and not just life, but abundant life, overflowing life. You know, it doesn't take much to realize that we are in a spiritual battle. In fact, it's one of the things that we have to learn about early on in our walk with Christ because it's impossible for us to really serve God without realizing the price that was paid for us to have the opportunity to serve him, but also the war that we live within and, and really have on the earth that we have to, we have to navigate. You know, the Bible says that the enemy is under our feet, but just because the enemy is under our feet doesn't mean we don't have to deal with him. And I want to explain to you what that looks like, but I first want to, I love the quote, what T.D. Jake says. He says this, you must understand your enemy for you cannot defeat what you do not understand. You must understand your enemy for you cannot defeat what you do not understand. Today my message is entitled Stronger Than the Struggle. And I want to talk about and I want to help uncomplicate the spiritual battle that you face today. Now, some of us are very much aware of it. Others of us are just coming into knowledge of what's happening. And I think one of the greatest challenges we face as believers is, is the battle that I'm facing myself, is it God teaching me a lesson, or is it the enemy coming against me? And that question alone, if we don't know, we can often feel defeated in the battle right from the get-go. Because we don't want to resist God if he's trying to teach us something. And we definitely don't want to empower the enemy. And we also don't want to blame either of them if it's just us. And so today I want to unpack and I want to give you some characteristics of what your, your spiritual, your soul enemy looks like. You know, I want to give you a quick synopsis of what, I guess, a theological understanding of when we talk about the enemy it looks like. Because we talk about the devil or we talk about things, but we don't often realize we have to go back to the beginning to understand what's happening. You know, it's not God and the devil as two gods fighting each other. <laughs> the devil was an angel with a God complex. There's not two gods warring. It's one God and it's a scrawny little angel that thinks he has some power, but really he doesn't and he won't have it very much longer. You see, in the Bible, Jesus, not Jesus, he wasn't, he was in the Bible, yes, but not in heaven. In heaven, the enemy lived there. And Lucifer was an angel. He was a created being. And he was actually, the Bible says, he was made of instruments and he led worship. He was a vital part of heaven. And at one point, he saw that God was getting glory and he thought, I'd like some of that. And God said no. Now, God wasn't being narcissistic or somehow saying, no, I'm the only one and I'm not giving it to you. 
You see, God knows in his sovereignty that none of his created beings are created to hold glory. Glory destroys the human soul. Glory des destroys a created being because we're not made. Only God is created to receive glory and praise and adoration and, and allegiance. Only God is created. It's actually part of who he is. And so let me ask you this. There's some places in the world where people have received some glory and it's destroyed them. Do you possibly know some people where they've gotten a little bit of praise of man and it hasn't been a good thing for them. It's destroyed their soul, the way they think about their life, the way they feel about their life, the decisions that they make, they make it towards pleasing people or feeling affirmed or adequate by who thinks they're amazing. Come on. And it actually destroys their inner being. They, they, you actually don't gain confidence by praise of man. No matter what we think, some of the most praised people are the most insecure people. It's, it's not one plus one equals two in the world. It doesn't, just because you have a title or an education or an income or, or something does not validate or does not somehow solidify the fact that you are a confident person. Confidence comes from an identity and an identity must be grounded into how we were created, why we were created and what we're called to do. And our identity gets grounded in our purpose. And purpose is only found in the one that created us. The only person, listen, you cannot find your design and what you were created for unless you find the one who created it. Come on. Whoever created the car, you have to go to, the, how, why, okay, tell me the features of the car. We don't go to like our six-year-old and go, hey, what do you think the features are of this new Tesla? He's not going to know why. He didn't create it. And sometimes we'll go to the places in the world and say, tell me what you think of me. Tell, you, tell me my value. Tell me how, what I was called to. And, and there'll be educational places. Well, you need this academic and you need this master's degree and you need this and then you'll be worthy. No, 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 no. They did not create that. Well, this is beauty. You have to be this thin. You got to look like this. And, and we'll go and we'll, we'll worship at this place and go, okay, tell me. And, the, and they'll say, this is how you're going to feel confident. This is how you're going to feel worthy. And you'll realize, gosh, I, I don't feel much more worthy or more confident. Why? Because they didn't create you. They don't know what's going to fill your soul. They don't know. They don't know what the right thing is for you. Only God, the God of the universe who made you, designed you, fashioned you, framed you, knows exactly how you think, how you process your personality, everything about you. God is not confused. He's not disappointed. He's not like, wow, that's a bummer. <laughs> Angels, pray. Pray hard. No, no, no. Listen, we all have a, we, we have, we are soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, the way we think about life, the way we feel about life, and the way we make determinations and decisions are all unique. And it cr actually, all of that pulls together and becomes our personality. And that's why we need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit because he's helping renew our soul and, and acknowledge what God is saying about us. And we're partnering with truth, but we've got to understand it's not your truth. There is a truth that we partner with. People go, I just need to find myself. You don't want to find yourself. You're going to get to the end of the rainbow and realize you are the same person that you started out with. You want to find the one who created you to help define you. That's the value of finding God. And so that was some good preaching. I'm just going to amen myself. So it says this in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life. When I started to unpack this kind of idea of spiritual warfare, because I don't know about you, the church is very confused by spiritual warfare. Come on. One side of the church is like, we never talk about it. We're never going to talk about spiritual warfare. It's very scary. If somebody acts a little weird, we're going to take them in the back with sister so-and-so. They're going to be delivered. There might be some vomiting, but we don't know. It's over there. And we're positive there's something in Ouija board involved. We're not sure, but we think it's over there, right? And, and there's churches that will never talk about it. It's like, it's scary. Don't be weird. I don't want to talk about it. And, and we're not sure. Then there's other parts of the church that are like, here, devil, there, devil, everywhere, devil, devil. <laughs> Come on. It's like they sing about it. They pray about it. They preach about it. It's like, if you, don't, if you forget to look at the devil, he'll slip right from out from under your feet and get you. You run out of gas, the devil took your gas, right? 
I remember thinking like, does the devil have time to siphon our gas? Is that what he's doing on the earth? Is he, does he need gas? I mean, I don't know what's... You sneeze in front of them and they're like, be released. You're like, I just a sneeze. No, it was more, it was? Listen, there, there, there are, there's environments where it's like, if we are not on high alert, we're gonna miss everything. And, and I, I understand that there are personalities and gift mixes that lend itself to more of a mystic and more of a spiritual experience. But I'm like, listen, I have to go to the word of God and I've got to figure out, number one, we are all called to do battle. God calls each of us a warrior. God calls each of us a soldier. God calls each of us to be fully armed. So that's not a personality or a gift mix or some kind of spiritual title. He doesn't say, pastors, wear the armor of God. The rest of you, good luck. <laughs> Come on. He calls all of us to be part of the army of God, which means spiritual warfare is not a title. It's not a gift mix. It's not an intercession thing. We're all supposed to participate in it, but can we please have a little spiritual warfare without being weird? Can I get an amen? amen? And what I realized is that it's biblical, but it also is supposed to be really practical, not just either or. So in order for us to acknowledge our enemy, we've got to understand him. I love how T.D. Jake says it. He says, you must understand your enemy for you cannot defeat what you do not understand. You must understand your enemy. For you cannot defeat what you do not understand. The way that we understand it is we look in the word. And when the word says this, the thief comes. That word in the Greek is a very simple word. Thief is the word klepto. It's where we get the word kleptomaniac. It's where we get in the English language that word. And what it's describing if you go deeper into that word in John 10:10, 10, 10, you'll find that it's related to being a pickpocket, an embezzler, someone who takes not because they need it, listen, listen, but because they want it. You see, this is very important. Sometimes we'll say, what does it really matter? I'm not a pastor. What's it really matter? I'm 17. Why am I dangerous to the kingdom of God? Like, seriously, I'm not doing anything. I'm just trying to pay my bills and hang out. I don't know. I'm not, how can I be dangerous to the kingdom of God? You see, you have to understand, it's not, it's not how much you possess, it's what you possess. It's not like, oh, you know, I, and you know, it even goes so far as to say, it's not even what you possess, it's who you are. You see, you're a child of God. And every time you acknowledge you're a child of God, it reminds the enemy that he no longer has a position. He'll no longer fill that role. And he knows everything you have access to. And it drives him crazy. He hates that about you. He doesn't want you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to be with God. He, he lives on the earth. Let me give you this. I, I didn't say all of this, but the enemy lived in heaven. He was a worship leader. He looked at God, asked for the glory. God said, no, there was a war that broke out in heaven. Lucifer was cast down to the earth, called Satan, and a third of the angels went with him, and they're now called demons. They live on the earth, and they believe anyone, listen, who's on the earth is fair game, which means as long as you haven't accepted Christ and are following him and living your life for him, then he has an opportunity to deceive you and take from you and take you with him. And he is very excited about the fact, and it's a mirage because the war has been won, and it's a matter of time before he is eternally damned. He's already, has, he's already eternally damned, but actually doesn't have any more power to take any, any more souls with him. And he is in a fight for his life to take as many of us with him. Now, the good news is the war has been won. And the good news is... We're going to eternity in heaven. If we serve Christ and we believe what he is, who he says he is, and he did what he said he would do, and we begin to live following him, then our eternity is set. But we still have to realize there's a war that rages for the souls of men. There is a war that rages for the souls of men. And we have to be alert, the Bible says. We have to be alert. And so it's very important as we look at this, the enemy, is he loves to take. You get a little bit of joy, the enemy's coming after it. Get a little bit of peace, he wants the peace. 
You get a little bit of healing, a little bit of purity, a little bit of confidence. The enemy's coming after it. Why? Because he just compulsively wants it. It doesn't matter if you think it's much value or not. He wants to take it from you. And let me say, he wants to take it and then create the lie that says it was never really there. Come on. Have you ever had that? Where you all of a sudden you go, I thought I had peace. Now, maybe that was, maybe that didn't really happen. I thought it was healed, but maybe it didn't really happen. Listen, if the enemy can get you to believe a lie, you will empower him in your life. But the moment you actually partner with truth is the moment you stay powerful in your life. And so this is very important. The Bible says that thief comes to steal and to kill. That word kill in the Greek is the word thoro, which actually means sacrifice. So this is what it comes down to. What the enemy cannot take from you, he will convince you to give away. What the enemy cannot take from you, he will convince you it has no value. Your life has no value. Your purity has no value. Your confidence in God has no value. And he'll begin to take it from you. And I understand this because that was my story. You see, I was a church kid. My dad was a traveling evangelist. And my dad traveled out, uh, on the road for eight months out of the year. And I have an identical twin sister. And we and my mom traveled with my dad six months out of the year growing up. And I was very much trying to hide in church. And I was trying to hide because I dealt with a deep sense of self or shame and self-hatred because I had learning issues. I didn't even realize I had learning issues till about fifth grade is when I really began to realize when they would take me out and begin to test me. And I would realize that other students were getting things a lot faster than I was or I would study all night and pull a C and then not study at all and pull a C. And then I began to realize that I didn't just start getting lost in school. I remember not knowing anywhere that I was. We'd go into a class, and I, I wouldn't know what anybody was talking about. And in high school, I could not even read out loud. And I could not read my own handwriting. No one could read my own handwriting, which was difficult because I was not going to medical school. <laughs> and so at 17... We used to joke about this, but people would say, what are you gonna do with your life? I'd say, my twin sister was gonna go to nursing school and I would say, I'm going to live off my parents. And I would joke, but deep down inside, it was hiding a part of me that was terrified that I wasn't gonna be enough. I came from a very high academic, educated family. My grandfather was a congressman as an Italian immigrant, came over on, the, on Staten Island, lived in a one bedroom apartment with five of his siblings and became a five term Congressman, we have pictures in the house of him with Kennedy and the Pope and different people. I've, a lot of my cousins went to Ivy League schools and were very high academic, and I was the girl that was barely making it. So I thought I'd hide. And I went into the car one night to go to a party with some guys. And as we're driving to this party, the music is playing, 90s R&B, it's hard to beat. I think, yeah, a little Bobby Brown. And um, we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I hear the voice of God. Like, I, I don't hear it, but I, I sense it speaking to me. And he says, Havala, what are you doing? You can't live like this. I've called you to more than this. You can't, you can't be here. And I felt this compelling voice, this compelling presence to do something. I didn't know what to do. I'm 17. I'm very awkward, I'm hiding in the backseat of this Mustang hoping that no one ever sees what's going on. And as I, I feel this, I know I have to say something. So I make a decision. I'm going to say something. So I ask the guy in the front, can you turn the music down? And the guy turns the music down. And I say this because I didn't have it planned out when I'm 17. I say, I have a call of God on my life. <laughs> it's extremely awkward. It wasn't like anything. I mean, it was like some pastor's like, that's right, sweetheart, we love you. Like nothing, just <laughs> no music, nothing. 
And I, when I say it, I'm instantly emotional because I know I'm, I'm coming. Listen, when we go public with what we really believe, it's a powerful moment when we say, I'm gonna go public with those people that's gonna cost me the most with. So I'm going public in the backseat of this car and, that sounds weird, but anyway. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever gonna say that again. Anyway, it sounds perverse. I'm sure it's not perverse, but maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know what teenagers are saying. Is pop, is pop like a, anyway, okay. So I'll look on an Urban Dictionary later. So I lean over and I'm beginning to cry. I lean over at my, my twin sister. I have an identical twin sister. We are mere twins. So I'm left-handed, she's right-handed. We look a lot, a lot, a lot alike. Like uh, we are, we were married six months apart. Our first babies are nine days apart. Our second babies are three weeks apart. And our third babies are three months apart. And they all have the same dad. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. So that's inappropriate. But... No, really, her husband is, is he, he's a British guy, he's like six foot three, but we look so much alike, our husbands get us mixed up, and her husband has hugged me, and I have literally said, I am not your wife, you need to let go of me. He's just like, I'm like, Dan, I can't, I get pregnant very quickly, you need to back away. Like, this is not a good thing. So, so he, um, So as I'm saying this in the backseat of the car, I'm going public. I say this because I'm filled with compassion for my friends. I say, you're welcome to come with me if you like, but I'm gonna serve God. This is what I'm gonna do. And they didn't say anything. It wasn't like an instantaneous revival in this car. No one says anything. It's more awkward than ever. I'm crying, my sister's crying. And we look out and we realize that the guys had taken us home without asking. That's how awkward it was. So I'm like, okay, here's our exit. So we get out of the car and we walk into the house. It's dark, my parents are asleep. And we go into the bedroom, one of our bedrooms. We kneel down by the bed and we say this out loud. God, I'm not much. I'm young, 17. I'm a girl. And I have no special gifts or graces on my life that I ever think about giving you that would wow you. But if you can use anyone, you're welcome to use me. And you know, if you ever said a prayer like that and you kind of wish God would open the heavens or at least like give you an angel just to solidify what it was. But you know, I didn't have a, an encounter that night. I said the prayer, said it with my whole heart, said it out loud, turned out the lights and went to bed. But I learned a really valuable lesson. I learned that if you mean it in your heart, you believe it in your heart, and you say it with your mouth, it's as good as done. And heaven begins to move on your behalf. And I learned that night that everything counts. And sometimes God will not give us an emotional experience because he wants us to actually have an, an intelligent, come on, and intel, the Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your heart. Did I say that? Heart, mind, heart, heart, mind, soul, thank you. I was like, not two hearts, we're not. Who has two hearts? Whales? What is it? <laughs> Dr. Hey, who? Is this a TV show? Or we're talking, we're talking about an animal here. Okay. Okay, so. You're, you're just going to throw out some TV show at me. Okay, so. Heart, actually mind in that verse means intellect. So it says we're to love God with all of our intellect. Isn't that awesome? That means we as believers don't have to leave our brains behind, praise God, but we can actually think about what we're doing and offer God the intelligence and the faith and mixing that together and saying, I see you, I believe in you, and outside of what I know of you, I'm with you. Huge. So I learned that night that the enemy is coming to steal from us, but that word kill means to sacrifice. And so what I learned in my own life is what the enemy cannot take from you, 
He will convince you to give away. And that's what I was doing with my confidence. That's what I was doing with the call of my life. That's what I was doing with my free time. I was giving it away because I assumed it didn't hold any value. My value wasn't with what I had to offer. My value came because I was a child of God and I had access to everything. Your value does not come by your education or by who likes you or how much is in your bank account or whatever. Your value comes because you are a child of God and you have access to everything. So how do we fight the enemy? I'm going to give you a quick practical way that we fight the enemy. Apostle Paul teaches this foundational verse in Ephesians chapter 6. And if you do any kind of studying on spiritual warfare, you'll read this. But he goes in and he says, listen, you guys are going to need an armor to protect yourself. And if you read the whole chapter, you'll get more of the whole picture. But he begins to go through each element of the armor of God to protect us. But when you jump down to verse 16, you'll find that he gives us some insight into fighting the enemy. He says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which to extinguish the the flaming arrows of the evil one, which is interesting. The shield of faith, back in the day, Roman soldiers used to oil up their shields so that when a flaming arrow came, it would slip right off. And oil is related to the presence of God. And it's interesting, the way that we protect ourselves from the enemy is to have oiled shields of faith. Our faith needs to be oiled up with a live presence, an active presence, that when the enemy comes, it extinguishes it. That was free. That was not part of the message. But then it says this, take up, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Everyone say the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. Now, when we hear word of God, how many of you grew up in church? Just wave at me for a minute. Okay, so a lot of us. So when we said word of God, we thought Bible. How many of you have been taught that? The word of God is your Bible. Okay, good. You've been taught, right? And so there is two definitions that the author would have written or used in the Greek. Now, word of God gets translated the same in English, but in the Greek, there are two different definitions for the same word. One of those is called logos. Logos means entire written word. So this is my logos. If I said to my, my husband, hey, hand me my logos, he can hand me my Bible. In fact, there's a Bible software for pastors out there called Logos Software, and it's basically identifying the whole word. But Apostle Paul does not say, take up your logos. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, take up the lo- your logos, which is the word of God. He says it this way. He takes it sort of, I'm sorry, which is the logos. He uses an entirely different word. He uses the word rhema. And rhema means, for all my note takers, it means a quick and specific word from the spirit. So he says this, when you are dealing with the enemy, get your rhema word and deal with him. Now, this would not have a lot of context until I teach you what a Roman soldier would have imagined. See, these guys were part of the Roman culture, and they would have understood when he was talking about an armor. And, you know, we're just disconnected. In California, it's it's not that often we see people like our soldiers walking around with armor. You know, it says there's a disconnect. I mean, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Helmet, okay, I get it. But in their historically, uh, in their historical place, they would have understood what this meant. Because they had soldiers walking around them all the time. And what they would have imagined is a soldier used to carry around a large sword, right? Now, we see movies that, are, that have kind of back in that, that um, a, uh, time frame. And we would see them with large swords. How many of you guys have seen movies that are gladiator? How many of you have seen the gladiator? Just wave. Okay, put your hands down. You're in church. Don't ever admit that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like they're like bloodbath, huge swords and lots of slashing and cutting. And, but that's actually not true historically when it's talking like this. You see, Roman soldiers would have carried around a very large sword. In fact, it would have been twice the weight of a regular bat- sword that they used in battle. And they would have actually walked around with the sword to build endurance and strength. And they would have practiced twice a day. They had a regimen of twice a day wielding that sword and, and, and building strength and endurance. But when it came to battle, it did not look like that. In fact, it looked more like this. 
It was more of the size of a dagger or a switchblade. Might be a large switchblade, but you know what I'm saying. Like, and it was, they were actually taught, theologians will tell you, they were taught to only, actually, to never cut and slash, because that will waste their energy. They were taught to stab. And they were taught to look at their opponent, their, their enemy, and see where they were most vulnerable and to only stab and do it as quick and as precise as possible to save energy for the battle. And they said it only usually had to go in two inches to kill them. So when it came to the, what Apostle Paul is saying in this passage, he's saying, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He's not saying, take up the sword that you've been building endurance and strength with. He's saying, take up the sword that's the quickest, fastest, most articulate thing that you've been trained in and use it quickly and get on with the battle. This is very key. So, it's very important that we understand that the word of God, listen, this is your pantry, but you got to make meals out of your pantry. So what will happen often is we're in the word of God on a daily basis and we're listening to podcasts and we're singing theology and we're going to come to church on a Sunday morning and seeing a really, really gorgeous blonde preacher or we're, um, it's very inappropriate. Um, or we're, you know, we're, we're getting around the word and we're building endurance and strength and we're memorizing and we're doing devotionals and we're, we're building a pantry. But when it comes to the battle, the reason we get endurance and strength and we build our pantry is when the enemy comes to lie to you, you have to go into your pantry and the Holy Spirit will illuminate a word to you. And that word is anointed to deal with your enemy. The reason you are battling and exhausted is because you don't know the word. You don't have anything, and so you're like, I better go to Expressions 58, and maybe Pastor Jennifer will give me something from her pantry. Now, she can for a little bit, but the truth is, the Bible says there's been a season when you've been drinking milk, but now it's time to eat some meat. And what I find is people get done with church when they don't want to do the work themselves, and they feel like what what the pastor's serving is milk. And it's like, yeah, you think? Because you're not created to get your rhema word from your pastor every week. You're created to get your rhema word from your history in God, from your history in the word, from growing. You go, well, I, you know, I'm just a young guy. Listen, if you're 18, God sees you as an adult. This isn't like, well, you know, I'm still living with my parents. I don't care. God doesn't care. You're an adult. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. And when it comes to your spiritual life, you've got to grow up. You gotta stop waiting. Well, when I get married, then I'll get serious. When I have kids, no, you won't. No, you won't. Because marriage doesn't change people. Babies doesn't change people. Come on, you know that's true. Some of my parents understand that. Life does not change people. People change because they make choices. And when we start to put power into decisions or someone else's hands is the moment we actually become powerless. The moment we decide to part the Holy Spirit and say, I have the power to change and be who I'm called to be. Wow. Come on. So I used to be intense. I won't take you there, but Luke chapter four, Jesus is met by the enemy. And the enemy comes to him and he says, hey, I know you've been fasting for 40 days. Turn those rocks into bread. And Jesus doesn't look at the enemy And he doesn't fight the enemy by saying, I'm so loved. I'm the son of God. He doesn't say, do you know what happened to me in the last chapter? Chapter three, like I walked through the desert and God, like I I was baptized. And the heavens opened and my father shouted out over all of the earth. This is my beloved son. I'm so loved. Let me tell you about my encounters. Let me tell you my prophetic words. Let me tell you. Jesus did not fight the enemy by explaining to to the devil what his prophetic destiny was. He actually gave us a strategy that would empower us 4,000 years later in Glendale, California, 2018. He would say, I'm going to give you a strategy. Could I have dealt with the devil and shut him up? Absolutely. Could I have gotten rid of him? Absolutely. I have power you do not have. But Jesus always did things that we could use later when he wasn't on the earth 
to duplicate and use. He was empowering us because he knew we would be on the earth now and we would need a strategy that needed to be used generation after generation. Come on, people group after people group. It would not lose the power. And so he was strategizing in, 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 in Luke chapter 4, and he says this to the enemy, it is written. And the enemy every single time, in fact, the second time, the devil quotes scripture to Jesus. This is interesting. Sometimes the enemy will quote scripture to us to keep us in bondage. Oh, how do you know that? Because it's in the Bible, Luke chapter 4. You see, when we're religious, we'll use scripture to keep people doing the right thing. But that's not the rhema word. The rhema word sets us free, sets us free. And so what happens in Luke chapter 4 is Jesus keeps saying, it is written, it is written. It is written, and he's telling us, listen, there's a power when we put, every time we know what's written, he's putting a weapon in our hands, and he's saying, say it again, say it again, say it again. Your rhema word is not your favorite Bible verse. I understand that you have loved your Bible verse, and, but that's 30 years old. <laughs> God wants to give you fresh, a fresh rhema word for 2018. What came against you in 2017 that you need to be armed for in 2018? What's the thing that every time you come into an environment like this, your anxiety goes up when you begin to think about something? What happens when you come into environments and, and all of a sudden you start to feel empowered and you feel disempowered? What is that one moment? Why is that? Maybe it's because God wants to put a rhema word and you deal with him. Now, I understand this. Again, I remember when I was 17, I began to travel. I'm going to finish with this story. 17, I began to travel at, at, at 17 and a half. And we ended up going to our first ministry night was in Utah. It was beautiful. God just showed up. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but it was, it was a pretty profound night. I thought I had ministry down. I was like, all right, we can do ministry. No big deal. So the next month we go to Arizona to do the same thing. We're going to preach to the youth group. We're going to pray. We're going to have an altar call. We're going to prophesy. what we're going to do. And at the middle of the altar call, the youth pastor shuts the whole service down, grabs the mic, takes it through a whole nother uh, like direction and then shuts it down. And it was a little bit odd, but again, we're new to this. We're not sure what's happening. So that night we go out to dinner and I say to the youth pastor, so what did you think of tonight? And he said, do you really want to know? Now I would like to give you a secret in life. <laughs> if somebody asks you if you really want to know, you should say no <laughs> and you should walk away. Cause that's a warning. That's like a warning sign. Like that's, that's the warning shot. It's like the clicking of the gun. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I said, yeah, I'd like to know. He said, well, I don't believe in anything you did tonight. I don't believe in women doing what you just did. I don't believe in what you spoke about the message you brought. And if I had known what you would bring, I would have never had you. Beautiful night. And have you ever had someone say something to you where you feel like you wish you had had a comeback, but because you were so utterly shocked, you didn't know what to say, you just walked away and went, I, I don't have any words for that. So I remember going to my parents' hotel room and they were asleep. My dad was preaching in another church in the area. We woke them up and I'm crying. This mean man said this. And my dad says something to me that's forever marked my life. He said, well, I guess you get to decide if man called you or God called you. It's powerful. Love it. Use it. Hear it. And I would love to say that from that moment on, what my dad said broke off everything that man said, and I've been free ever since. But in all honesty, for years... Every time I would get up to preach, which I did, I cleaned houses during the week to pay for gas to preach to up and down the California coast for many, many years. I would hear what that man said. And I would get up to preach and I would hear him say, if they knew what they were gonna get, they would never have you, but go ahead. They, you, sh you can get up there and preach, but there's a lot of people in here that don't believe in women doing what you're doing. You can get up and preach, but it's not the message they want to hear. And at times when I was young and immature, I'd be like, oh, shut up, devil, you know, and just pour up. And I'm just going to praise my way through it. 
But it got so bad. Have you ever had this in your life where it gets so bad you almost don't want to step out because you know the battle that's going to be in your heart to do it? And so I would think, like, if I go to preach, I don't want to battle with that guy's words. So I had anxiety because I knew it's coming. The battle's coming because I'm about to do what I don't want to do and battle him. And so there's just this kind of weird cycle that happens when we have things like that. And it wasn't until one day I'm in my word and I'm telling you, I, again, just because I got saved and loved God doesn't mean I immediately knew how to read and immediately could write well and immediately, I mean, everything has been a battle. Everything has had to, I've had to work through. But the Holy Spirit takes me to First Timothy. Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, a young leader. And he says this, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your life, in your faith, and in your purity. And when he says this, I felt like the Holy Spirit put a weapon in my hand. And he said, don't let anyone look down on you again because you're called to set an example. And I've called you and I've set you apart. And I've put you there. So don't ever be ashamed of where you are or what you're called to do. And I got up the next time to preach and I had the same demonic mind thing going on of just lies and embarrassment and shame. And, you know, I'm about to make a fool of myself and, and, and try to pray my way through it or prophesy my way out of it. And, oh, just chaos. And the Holy Spirit put this in my hand. And I said, enemy, I am called to set an example. And if you hang out a little longer, I'll make an example of you. And when I said that and I quoted the whole scripture, I felt like what had been holding me back for years lost all its power. I didn't forget about what the man said. It just lost its power. And what I think in our lives is there are things that have been said over us this last year, opportunities that have happened, relationships that have been broken, things that we are battling right now, and it's a whirlwind, and we're trying to prophesy our way out of it and pray our way out of it and preach our way out of it, and God goes, would you just allow me to put a weapon in your hand, and let's deal with it because it's wearing you out. You're getting overwhelmed. You're wearing your friends out. <laughs> your spouse loves you, but stop it. It's time for you to get the well-made weapon that's fashioned for you to deal with it and go after it. And I'm talking about getting aggressive. You go, how do I get aggressive? You're gonna have to open your mouth and you're gonna have to say, it is written, enemy. And there are times when I've had to quote, my rhema word was, I am clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It is not I that live, but he that lives in me. So get over here, devil. I wanna put some clothes on you. Come on, you begin to get the word of God. I can't use Timothy, I'm not young anymore. But you have to use things <laughs> that are yours. Yeah. Your rhema word is not my rhema word. I don't know what you've been through, but God does. Yeah. And God has everything you need in here. But sometimes you're not gonna find it because all you're looking for the scraps. And I'm saying, build your pantry. Right. Get your pantry so full that the spirit of God goes, that's what I'm highlighting. That's what I'm acknowledging. That's what I want in your life. Listen, the Holy Spirit wants you to know that you are stronger than your struggle. That, that God, the Holy Spirit lives within you and the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now dwelling within you. How come you have problems when you have the Holy Spirit? How many of you have problems? I have problems. Okay. The reason you have problems is not because you didn't receive the fullness of God, which is what the enemy wants you to believe. The enemy wants you to believe that something's wrong with you. Most of us here, the enemy say, there's something wrong with you. Everybody else is getting it. There's something wrong. You've always had something wrong with you. Come on. There's you are, there's something you didn't get. It didn't stick. It stuck with everybody else, but not you. Something's off with you. Come on. And what that is, is see your mind is where your thoughts come from. Your emotions are where your feelings come from, right? Your feelings and emotions. And your will is where your determination and your decisions come from. And all of that requires a renewing and a surrendering. You renew your thoughts, the Bible says, by putting it under the authority of Jesus Christ and actually taking each thought captive, which means you gotta take each thought and hold it up and say, I believe I was made wrong. What do you think about that, God? 
I believe that you're going to abandon me. What do you think about that, God? I believe that I'm too old for it to matter. And you begin to hold them up and you sit with it in courage and you let the spirit of God dismantle what the enemy has held against you. And that's some good preaching right there. You're going to get that in a little bit. You're going to get that in a little bit. I'm saying this not because it sounds good. I'm saying this because it's exactly what I have done with my own life. I'm preaching out of my process. And I'm seeing this, and we've seen this with thousands of people around the world. This is a real thing. And why, what happens with your will? God, you don't renew your will. You surrender your will. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. You don't have to wear a turtleneck to be meek. Meekness means strength under submission. So sometimes we want, God, I want this job. I want this opportunity. I want this woman. I want this whatever it is. Listen, listen. But not my will, your will be done. We don't act like we don't have a will. Well, I don't know, just whatever God wants. I'm just here to serve God. I'm just so, I just, I'm so holy. Stop it. <laughs> Even Jesus didn't do that in the garden. Jesus said, listen, my will is I don't want to go to the cross. I would love it if we could just pass on this. I, my vote is, I would like to not do this. <laughs> but he said this, not my will, but yours be done. You get the final vote. You get the veto vote in my life. You are the one that leads me. You are the one that protects me. You are the one that knows what's best, and I'm with you. Yes. Some of you, you have a strong will, and you want to know why God won't violate your free will to make you humble. <laughs> the God, God doesn't say, I will humble you. He says, humble yourself. Humble yourself before God. And then your emotions. Some of you are so led by emotions. It's like, it's, you never know how you're going to do today. It depends on what feelings you feel. You know what? Your feelings are not supposed to be Lord of your life. Your feelings give you insight to what you believe. And so if your emotions are dominating you, go deeper and figure out what you believe. And your emotions will begin to connect with truth. So, I want to pray for you, and then we'll go. You can close your eyes if you want. Mostly just want you to cut out distraction for a minute. I want us to take a minute to respond to this word. I feel like there's a breakthrough anointing in the room for this. And so, I want to, I want to ask you, some of you in the room, you'd say, you know, Havala, I hear you preaching. I'm starting to feel like there's a breakthrough, but... Quite honestly, I feel like the enemy just keeps taking from me. Every time I get a little bit of confidence, a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy, a little bit of clarity, I feel like the enemy comes and he takes it from me. And I'm done. I'm calling him out on this. And I'm not going to let him take from me anymore. 2018 is going to be a year that I hold on to truth. If that's you, just wave at me. Say, that's me. And I, I'm at a place. Good. Lots and lots and lots of hands. Some of you today, you would say, you know, Havala, it's nice not taking it from me. I keep giving it away because I don't see the value of it. And I keep thinking when I feel powerful, then I'll hold on to it. And right now I'm realizing that the enemy has been lying to me and I keep giving away my confidence of me being a child of God and I'm done. I'm not going to give it away anymore. Uh, uh, in 2018, I want to come in strong with courage to believe what he says about me. If that's you, wave at me. If that's me. Good. Lots of hands. I want to pray for you today. Lord, I thank you for these men and women. Lord, I, I understand that some of these things go so deep, it started at childhood. But I ask you, God, that you would put a weapon in each of their hands this year. Lord, I just prophesy that they will receive a rhema word the next couple, couple days, and that word's going to be their word for the year, and they're going to walk in it, and they're going to stay with it, and they're going to see breakthrough like never before. What their dad said about them, what their mom said about them, what a friend said about them, what a coworker, what, it, what the industry said, whatever it is, it's going to be dismantled, and truth is going to prevail. So I bless them, and I thank you for their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen.